So I'm, I'm delighted that, that Kelvin has come here. This is um, a great honor, Kelvin. Thank you well, very much for coming. Well, it's a privilege for me. And we're yes, very yes. lucky that he is able to come here. And I think it's because Parliament is in recess at yeah. the moment, isn't yeah. it? Otherwise, we're no chance. <laughs> um, so um, I have no idea what, how you're going to follow the film. Um, well, no, neither have I, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I should say something. It yeah. is quite a hard thing to, to follow yeah. because it is so powerful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I hope you in, enjoy the, the discussion. Kelvin, thank you very much for coming yeah, again. Thanks very much indeed. But if I speak for 10 minutes, 15 minutes maybe, um, and, uh, and then after that do some questions and contributions rather than questions that I'm not uh, all-knowing, but uh, we can all make our contributions. But uh, when I came here tonight, I had no idea what I was going to see. No, I'd never heard of the film, let alone seen it. Um, and it's obviously you know, mind-blowing what we've seen, except that, of course, I did know about it because I, you know, I was involved in Parliament at the time and I, I had to tell one or two stories about what happened at the time. But uh, I have to say, and I won't, I won't uh, disguise my politics, I always describe myself as a democratic socialist and that has completely reaffirmed my belief in democratic socialism. Um, and until we get some grip on capitalism, I don't think we're going to see the world in a better place. Um, and uh, you know, the, it was, um, was, was it extraordinary um, that at the end, you know, the world in a sense faced either the abyss, the complete the complex of the financial system, um, or bailing out the banks, um, and at least keeping the financial system operating so we don't see everything collapsing and millions of hungry people walking about the streets with no food. I mean, that's what we faced. So, um, but uh, I, I first heard the term subprime mortgage because my closest friend from university was a professor of accountancy and he had worked for several years at uh, Ernst & Young in the city. Um, he's written a great chunk of a book on accountancy um, and he knows about all, how all this stuff works. So I'm just a mere economist, and economists and accountants are very different people. You know, I can talk about macroeconomics and, 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 and so on, but uh, how the financial system works, you have to be a different kind of animal. And I'm not that kind of animal, but I've learned a lot from my friend Greg. And he said, um, he, he, he just told me about subprime mortgages. We were driving along, in, in his, he's retired, lives in France, driving along through Burgundy, collecting wine. Um, and he was telling me about subprime mortgages, and he was very angry about it. And he said, you know, how immoral it was to, you know, for people who want to make money to go and offer large sums of money to people who would never have a chance of paying it back or never even had any intention of paying it back, um, pretend it's a mortgage, put it together with lots of other mortgages into a bond, and then sell it off to someone else. On the, on the basis that this is a, 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 a profitable asset which will increase in value when it's actually absolutely worthless. And of course, these were sold not just in America but across the seas. They were sold to British banks. There are billions of dollars of worth of these things in British banks, worthless bits of paper based on mortgages. And he said if you go to, well, if you imagine yourselves all um, very poor people, never have a chance of any cash ever in your life, I come along as a, as, a, as a dealer and I say, well, I'll lend you, a, I'll lend you 100,000. All you've got to do is sign this bit of paper. I'll lend you, lend you 100,000 pounds. So some people say, I'll take that. Just imagine you're a drug addict. You know, you're never going to say no to money, are you? So you give them money or give them a, 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 a mortgage so they can you, draw, draw on that. Um, and then you get this bit, of, this bit of paper which says, I owe the bear, I owe you know, this company. $100,000 and you get all these knowing you're never going to get it paid back and the cynical guys who are in the bar there who, who you know, were just saying, well, we sell this to people. And then you persuade people that if you not just buy the house you're living in, much my broken down shack, not worth anything and you haven't got any money to pay it back, but you persuade other people to go around and say, well, if you borrow more from us, you can buy another house and buy a range of houses um, and uh, They'll all appreciate massively in price because of house prices go up always um, and you'll make a lot of money. So you borrow, borrow, borrow and you're not very sophisticated uh, uh, and that's what happens. I have to say, uh, back in, the, in, in the, the late 80s, I had a young man came to my door to try to sell me some life insurance or whatever. 
and uh, he could barely count. I mean, he was just sent out there to get my money, on signed on a bit of paper. He had no understanding of what what he was selling at all. Um, he just wanted me to sign a bit of paper, uh, which would pay a lot of money to an insurance company. You know, uh, and we were now seeing, you know, the, these these falsely sold um, instruments being uh, claimed against companies and so on. Um, Pips, I think, called, aren't they? Um, anyway, that 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 again, it was all part of that era, um, selling, gi giving money to people that couldn't pay it back, um, and selling on the, the, the bit of paper saying they owed it to other people. Um, and I remember, you know, it all suddenly came to a head in, 19, in 2008. And uh, I made a kind of joke of it, really, because Gordon Brown was just come pri become prime minister. And Gordon Brown uh, actually had, was one of those who persuaded the world the system to actually, we've got to refinance the banks, otherwise the whole system will collapse. Um, the, the alternative is a complete total collapse or um, giving these crooks a lot of money. And so they decided to give the crooks a lot of money. And I was in Parliament, he was Prime Minister, and I managed to get in a Prime Minister's question. And on one Friday morning, we'd had a private member's bill giving some workers rights. And I thought that was very positive and it, had been, it didn't actually get anywhere, but it had a second reading and a second reading vote was lots of Labour MPs piled in on a Friday, private member's bill, not whipped, but we, and we passed this second reading. And then we all went out into, in, into uh, New Palace Yard, which is just where, where, you know, next to Parliament, where Big Ben is. And we all sang the red flag. We thought, great, we've got a bit of a victory here. And then on the Monday or Tuesday, got the, um, we saw that Northern Rock was collapsing. People were queuing outside to take their money out of Northern Rock because they knew it was a bank. It was gonna, they wouldn't get their money back. Um, and Gordon Brown, at that moment, had to... The, the, well, the, the government had to nationalise um, the, the bank and ensure that people were going to get their money back. Northern Rock. So I said in Prime Minister's question, I said, well, last week, Prime Minister will remember, we passed a, a bill giving workers rights and we all went out and uh, sang the red flag in New Palace Yard. And now the government is nationalising a bank. At last, we're having socialism. And everybody fell about laughing, you know. But, you know, it, that, I remember it well, you know, and uh, I, I was never part of New Labour, never part of the Blair Brown group. I had utter contempt for them because they were on the wrong side. The division in politics and economics is actually between those people who believe in the free market and global finance capitalism and those people who believe that the state, the democratic state, should have a right to control the economy on our behalf and keep it under control. Um, and in fact, if you go back to the much maligned and much mocked 1983 Labour Party manifesto, we wanted to take, in our manifesto, take many of the financial institutions into public ownership so they'd be publicly accountable and could not do this sort of trickery. Um, and we were mocked and laughed at as being extremists. Um, and, uh, you know, we lost the election, basically because of the Falklands War, but nevertheless we lost, that, lost the election. Poor Michael Foote was mocked and derided and he was a very decent man like Jeremy Corbyn, another decent man who it, it bound up in this dreadful world of politics. Um, but, you know, we, 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 uh, we had seen this coming and there was an MP for Luton North or Luton West that time called Brian Sedgmore. Some of you may remember I was his party chairman. And Brian was a bit over the top in some ways, but he actually said the financial institutions are the problem. We have to get a grip on them. And this was back in the 70s and 80s when he was our MP. Um, and uh, subsequently, uh, he, he, over the Iraq war, he went and joined the Liberal Democrats. We all voted against the Iraq war, but he actually went and joined the Liberal Democrats, which I didn't approve of. And then he stood next to my Liberal Democrat opponent in Luton Town Centre uh, on the front page of the newspaper. Brian Sedgmore supports Liberal Democrats against his old friend, Kelvin Hopkins. You know. um, I didn't, wasn't terribly pleased about that, I have to say. And, and when Tony Benn came to speak for me in my election uh, in 2005, um, shortly after Brian had gone off, he said, uh, people said, is Brian, is Brian Sedgmore still your friend? I said, well, well, not really. I said, we, you know, having done what he's done, it's not nice. But subsequently we, we made it up and we, we had dinner together and uh, he, he said he was very, very sorry. He didn't realise what a terrible thing he'd done. But, um, and, and then subsequently, sadly, he died a few years ago and I went to his funeral. But, um, you know, he had been a very close friend for a long time. But anyway, he said, the financial system is what the problem is. We've got to get grip on the banks and the financial system. Otherwise, um, we, will, we will be in very, very deep water. 
and uh, that's what's happened here. There's no morality in there. The thing about this money, nobody, nobody was making anything. You weren't, they weren't growing food or making things that we can use or even building houses, you know. They were just playing with assets, playing with money and often playing with worthless bits of paper, but gambling with them. It was like a massive gamble, gambling, like, like Las, Las Vegas for the world. Um, and they were not actually making it. And even the guys who broke it, you know, at the end, they, they felt bad because, in a sense, they were drawn into the system and making money themselves as well. Um, but on the other hand, they did actually break it. And we thought at that time, and if you read Larry Elliott in The Guardian from time to time, I think he thought that capitalism would finally be brought to heel because of that. I mean, we're talk not talking about, um, you know, the mixed economy and post-war social democracy. We're talking about global free market capitalism where money can flow across boundaries. And if you remember, um, the th I think the biggest tragedy, the worst thing that Mrs. Thatcher, and you maybe love Mrs. Thatcher, but the worst thing she ever did was the first thing Geoffrey Howe actually did was, take, was, was introduced to get rid of exchange controls so money could flow out of the country. Uh, and once you've got money, vast billions of money, owned by billionaires, not by people like you and I, um, unless there's billionaires in the audience, of course. But um, if, if, if it can flow across boundaries, it can get and go anywhere. And of course, that globalization of finance capital was, was, I think, where the problem went. In the post-war era, and I've written about this and spoken about it many times, between 1945 um, and the 1970s, we had a world that worked. You're all too young to remember that. Well, maybe one or two of us aren't, but I do remember it. You know, it was, we had full employment. In fact, there was a constant labor shortage. We had a leaving sense of working people rose like they'd never wrote, risen before. Um, we had growing equality. We had a free health service, free education. Students at university paid no fees and got grants. Um, and uh, we saw no food banks. And, you know, not, we didn't see people living in the streets as we do now. Um, and ever since that break with the post-war world, it happened in 1979 and was building up before that, but actually broke when Geoffrey Howe and Mrs. Thatcher got control of the economy. That's when it all started to go wrong for us, and we led the way. We, are the, we were the most right-wing country in Europe, uh, and I think to an extent still are as well. We are privatising, globalising, um, pushing free markets and, and banking and capitalism. I have to say that um, Theresa May is different. I think she is actually sort of a, a genuine conservative. Conservatism means keeping things the same, essentially, keeping what's best in the past and, and not actually changing anything. So she's not a radical, but she is actually different from Cameron and Blair and the people who went before, who are all extreme free marketeers who believed in neoliberal capitalism. Uh, I th you know, she's talking about, um, she's actually, their housing policy, they say that it's an illusion to think we can all become owner occupiers now. It's absolutely impossible. So we have to look at renting and lo local authorities have to have a role in it. They're saying this, you can, can't imagine um, Blair saying that, you can't imagine Cameron saying that, but they're actually saying that now. And when it comes to industry, we've allowed industry to be destroyed by finance capitalism. Um, and we don't produce enough for our own good, our own use, and so we have massive trade deficits, particularly with the, e with the EU, but um, uh, we don't produce enough. We've allowed our manufacturing to, to, to wither away. And um, we've got, but now the government, Mrs. Uh, you know, Mrs. May is talking about an industrial strategy. Um, the idea of a strategy for industry, well, governments don't do that. Conservative free market governments, they, the market decides that. It's not for governments to intervene in the market. It's for the markets and the banks and money to decide all that. Um, but she's doing this and it's interesting. I took part in a debate when she, uh, shortly after she'd mentioned this, led by a conservative MP called Chris White for Leamington, and he was very keen on an industrial strategy, and I applauded him for what he said, but around him were two or three Tories who were going, the colour of that bit of paper, horrified. They were talking about an industrial strategy. They said, that's socialism. What about the market? What about the market? So there's a serious division within the Conservative Party now growing up between those who accept that the state has to have a role um, in managing economies, and those who say it should be the market and there should be no constraints and uh, the market will always produce the goods. And if you go back 30, 40 years, I remember um, Milton Friedman, who was a professor of economics at Chicago University and an extreme free marketeer, he was the great guru of, market, of, of, the, of the free market, 
following from the, the evil genius of it all, called Friedrich von Hayek. Anybody heard of Friedrich von Hayek? He was, he was uh, the one who wrote a book, which I read at university, or didn't write, I had it, but, um, called, called The Road to Serfdom. And he thought that any, if the state is involved in our lives in any way, providing free health and education, um, redistributing income, making sure that when people are unemployed or ill, they're looked after, all of that was going to make us all slaves. So we had to destroy all that, and get rid of the state in our lives, and leave things to the market. And that book, he, he wrote that book. And the, uh, when, um, when Mrs. Thatcher was elected, she had a copy of that book in her handbag, literally, and Friedrich von Hayek, an old man, said, um, at long last, I'm, this is the happiest day of my life, at long last, one of my disciples is in power. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've, we've gone on from there. We have at some, time, some stage to say, no, we've got to get a grip on our economy, start to, not talking about revolutionary socialism, just going back to the kind of post-war social democracy we had that was designed by people like John Maynard Keynes. Now Keynes was a, a member of the Liberal Party. Now he's regarded as an extreme left-wing socialist because he thought we ought to manage the economy to, to produce full employment. So that you know, governments have a role to you know, make sure people have jobs. Um, and uh, he explained, he was a genius, he was a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, and, um, and people accuse me of being some sort of revolution. I say, but I'm a left Keynesian. I believe in what John Maynard Keynes did and said. He designed the Second World War, the post-war world at Bretton Woods in 1944, and it all worked. And he said that when countries have a balance of trade deficit, they should be allowed to de depreciate their currencies to, to be more competitive. When, when they, if, and if a country like Germany, for example, has a massive trade surplus, they should be required to appreciate their currency to bring it back into balance. All of those things. That managed economy worked for 25 years, worked brilliantly. And when I was a child, I thought we were going to march in that direction continually. And then it was broken in the 19, end of the 1970s. It was smashed. The first thing that Jeffrey Howe did when he came in, he uh, raised interest rates. Um, the pound rose in value. One fifth of manufacturing disappeared. And unemployment went up to three million, just like that, um, in two years. And even Mrs. Thatcher started to get worried because she, she wasn't an economist, but she could see that things were not exactly right. But Geoffrey Howe was the extreme free marketeer. And it's very interesting that it's Geoffrey Howe who stabbed her in the back when she finally bit, bit the dust, um, made that speech in the Commons and, and savaged her because she was no longer of the true faith in his terms. Anyway, this, this, we've, we've lived through all this. It's still wrong. Um, and we still, and this, this film was, 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 you know, just, Stunning. I mean, I, I, I've never, and the fact I've never heard of it before was, was remarkable because it's a film I think everybody should see. It was, in the end, rather pessimistic. It was saying that, you know, they'll always be bailed out, you know, if, if we don't get a grip on them. But I think we've got to start in our own country by getting a grip. Um, and uh, one of the reasons I support the nation state, not against other nation states, but you have to manage economies in convenient lumps. And the convenient, natural, unit to manage the economy in is the nation state um, and it worked uh, before the, after the second world war uh, and i think we should manage our economy at that level the idea that it can be managed if you get rid of all barriers have money flowing across boundaries without any constraint with everything being pushed into private ownership that will not work in the end and we have to, i think to start a march back towards so, what m most people would call social democracy um, Americans would, might call it communism, but it actually, you know, social democracy, which actually worked, where we had a mixed economy, you know, and, and some parts of the economy in private ownership, some in public ownership, but the government managed the economy properly, and they had control of what money flowed in and out of the country, their control of the exchange rate, their control of interest rates, um, all of that has been attempted to give it to the market. I think we're at a turning point now, um, because many people, some of the newspaper economists are saying that actually we are starting to see the worm turning. It's interesting that Trump is a dreadful, dreadful man, but he's actually saying, I want to put industry back into the Rust Belt of America. In a sense, that's managing the economy. He may be terrible in every other way, but he's actually saying, I want to do things, well, he may not do it, of course, it may just be a ploy to get elected, but he's actually saying, I want to see these blue collar workers um, in Detroit and, and wherever. 
I want to see them with jobs again, so we've got to look after our own economy. Well, it, it sounds crude, it sounds nationalistic, but on the other hand, it's the beginning of managing economies at a national level again. Again, we see in France, um, uh, used to call it gaullism. I mean, even, in, even on the conservative side in France, you've got the gaullists who believe that it should be some national industries. We don't let them go abroad. And others who believe in the free market and, and, and globalization. And in Germany, of course, you've got uh, companies which are which the Germans are very keen to make sure are kept out in the ownership of German people. BMW, I think it's still family owned, but they're German, so they want to make sure it's owned by them. We've allowed uh, the, the borders to disappear, to money to flow out, everything's been sold, sold off to pay for our, 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 our balance of trade debts and so on. But um, the world is starting to change again, but I think we have to start to understand that that is wrong, absolutely wrong. It won't work, it will destroy people's lives, and in the end, we've got to get back to some world where dem people, democratically, through their governments, get a real grip of their economies again and start to create the civilised life, which I believe is, is perfectly possible um, once we understand and take power. Anyway, I could talk forever about this, but hopefully that's just a taster to get you started in questions. So, first of all, uh, thank you for coming here and give us the opportunity. And second, English is my fourth language. It's not hmm? even second language. So if you don't understand anything, <laughs> I can repeat again and I'm again. I'm full of admiration for having four <laughs> languages. I've only got one and a bit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, like what you said, we hope that the government control the financial institution. Mm. And I have two questions, and I won't have a chance to talk again, so I can ask two questions in a row. Yep. One financial institution is a private sector that is the you know, car insurance companies. Mm. I had insurance for about seven, six years, that was 380. Yeah. In 2010, they increased to 2,700. When I called them and they said to me there are many claims in Luton area. So I said I haven't claimed anything. So why you give like a collective punishment? And they were not agree with me. So the government don't have any control over that insurance companies. Mm -hmm. they, they just increase the, the premium on the basis of the, the area, the mm -hmm. claims. They do not assist the person, the person hasn't claimed anything. And second, the world has come out of recession, England has come out of recession, but Luton hasn't. Nowadays, if somebody works, the working class people, if they work 40 hours a week, even with the 80 pound per hour, 8 pound per hour, that person can get less than 1,200 mm. net. If a person pays, 900 and rent for two bedroom house. How can that person survive with the 300 pound to pay the car insurance, mobile bill, telephone bill, other bills? So as a Luton representative, do you have any idea how to get out of this situation? Number one, the car insurance, which is very, very high in Luton. Mm. And second, the house rent, which the people cannot afford. Well, I agree absolutely with your analysis, um, if I was in power. First of all, I think we should nationalise motor insurance so that as a state system like, when you have a universal state system like national insurance, it's very efficient, very fair, and it's incorruptible. And if we had that, I think we would solve I think in New Zealand many years ago, they had a, a nationalised state car insurance, motor insurance. I don't think there's any problem at all with that and it would avoid all the problems that we have with car insurance. You still have to have different premiums depending on, on your risk and so on, but nevertheless that could be done democratically through a state system and it would be much cheaper and there would be no, no problem. Having lots of different companies, they advertise, they, they, they're very inefficient the way they, they, they manage and so on. It, it, those, those sort of competitive arrangements are very, very small, very, very poor. And there are many other, a number of other sectors that are rather similar. Wages, as a part, of, as a proportion of the economy, have fallen very substantially. I think it's gone from sort of 61% of, of gross income down to about 49%. You know, it's a very substantial drop in wages as a proportion of the economy. So wages are too low. Wages should be raised. 
One of the reasons why we have low productivity, this is output per worker, is because employers know they can get cheap labour. And we've got to make labour more expensive again. And if we make labour more expensive, it gets them to, gets them to invest and the economy comes, becomes more, more productive. So um, wages, wages are too low. House prices are monstrous. When I first moved to Luton in 1969, I bought a three-bedroom house with a garage for £4,500, as it happens, but it was three times average earnings. Now house prices in, in Luton are typically 12 times average earnings. So it's, they haven't gone up with inflation, they've gone up by four times inflation, or four times you know, wage inflation. So you know, it, and it, it, is, it is immoral, and that is a house price bubble, if you like. Um, and one of the reasons they don't want to build too many houses is if you build too many houses, flood the market with too many houses, house prices must, thumb, must come down again. And first of all, the property speculators, property developers wouldn't like that. But also, unfortunately, people who live in owner occupation, like me, and many of you in here, would think, well, I don't want my house price to fall, even though it won't make any difference to you as a person, because we all think we're richer if our house prices go up. But we're not actually, it's still the asset we have. It's only when you own more than one, or you're a property developer, then it's significant. Uh, um, and if you can buy and sell houses to make a profit on them, that, that's different. But if you've just got your own house, um, house prices have gone up monstrously, and there are other countries where, the, where this hasn't happened. Um, I think we've got to, if we want to keep the housing market uh, at, at, a, at a reasonable level, we've got to build many more houses in the, in the, in the owner-occupied sector. But more importantly, we've got three million people on housing waiting lists who will never be able to afford owner occupation. We've got to start building local authority houses again. And if you look at those of you who know Luton, you go to certain parts like Lucy Farm, the Runfold Estate, you see these superb houses built sometimes 60 years ago. They're still in superb condition now, brilliantly built uh, when the economy was much poorer. If we could do it then, we could do it now. But they've chosen not to do that because they want to you know, play the game for the money maker, for the speculators, for the, for the property developers and so on. And also, when house prices go up, it means that, uh, you know, quite a lot of people vote for the government that's made the house prices go up. And it's interesting that the Tories, the Conservatives, I, I can't describe my politics, after 1992, when we had the collapse following the exchange rate mechanism, another bit of madness, we had the European exchange rate mechanism, and we joined it, and we couldn't sustain it, um, and what happened was interest rates went up and up and up to 15, 16%. And thousands of people just in Luton, uh, millions of people across the country, were either went into negative equity or lost their homes completely and went bankrupt. That was what killed off support for the Conservatives in the early 1990s and led to the massive victory of Labour in 1997. Nothing to do with the dreadful Tony Blair's looks. It was actually to do with the fact that the housing market collapsed. Unemployment went up to 2 million. And people said, I'm never, ever going to vote for that party again. They've forgotten now because there's a new generation come through. So, you know, these things happen. Folk memory doesn't last forever. But that's what actually happened. Um, so, you know, owner occupation is, is, is proving to be uh, an impossible dream for millions of people now. Um, and yet now we're in the hands of private landlords. And the government wants to set off, or certainly the previous government did, want even to get push... Um, uh, uh, housing association houses into, into selling, selling those off as well. Uh, many housing associations now want to become private companies. And one um, chairman of a housing association, meant to be for social housing, he said his ambition is to, ha is to be quoted on the stock exchange. He wants it to be, he wants to become a private housing company, pay, pay, you know, like a private landlord. But private landlords now are unconstrained. When I was a young person in the 1960s, when I was a student, um, we had a Labour government introduce rent controls. And we had very strong rent controls because before that we'd had Rackman landlords who used to go around with Alsatian dogs, terrorising tenants, um, threatening them um, and getting them, pushing them out if they didn't, couldn't pay the high rents. E exploitation by criminal gangs who, who effectively, pri private landlords who were effectively criminal gangs. We, it's not quite as bad as that yet, but on the other hand, private landlords, private landlordism is, is, uh, is, is not um, to most people's taste. Um, I would personally like to see a, a, a fair amount of municip municipalisation. If a lot of those private houses, particularly ones in poor condition, will compulsory purchase them at a reasonable price, um, not a massively inflated price, uh, taking account of the condition of the house, then we could bring the local authority into 
re renew, re re um, to repair the house, make it, put it in good working order, and rent it out. And of course, that sort of thing is not spending money that just disappears because you always get a return when you have rent. But if, uh, local, let's expand the, the local authority sector. Stop selling council houses. Anybody who's bought the council house, good on you because they were so cheap, you'd be foolish not to buy them. But uh, actually, it means that once that house is taken out of the private sector, it never it gets back in for future generations. And we've seen uh, you know, millions of council houses sold off, which has made a lot of people happy. And, uh, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher said, people, if you, we built, people who live in council houses vote Labour, so let's get rid of the council houses. Uh, and just recently, George Osborne, you know, hero, hero of everybody's, I'm sure, um, he said, why should we build council houses? They only go and vote Labour. The, the, the utter co contempt for the interests of ordinary people is appalling. But it's all to do with this globalisation, free market, free market uh, capital, finance capitalism, which is, which is making a mess of the world. Uh, and I think we've got to you know, challenge it all and have a bigger role for the state, not you know, only corner shops and vineyards and you know, be a lot of private companies, of course, carrying on doing things in manufacturing and elsewhere. But certain sectors of the economy ought to be either in public ownership or strictly publicly controlled so that ordinary people can have a decent place to live, can have enough money to pay the bills uh, and have, a, have a, 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 a good life for their children. So, you know, I'm unapologetic, I'm an old-fashioned socialist. Yes. I was interested in what you said about global capital. Um, do you see an end to the um, flow of, of money in and out of the country? Like in the 19, I can remember the 1970s, um, we weren't allowed to take money out of the country, you know. But you know, I feel myself that the genie is out of the bottle, you know. It, it, back then, the society was much more homogenous, whereas now the society, the society is much more international. And I feel that, you know, yeah, um, wouldn't be a good idea to go back in, in that way to such a tight control of money, you know, where people co couldn't take more than a hundred pounds out of the country. You know, it makes so many things impossible. It makes it impossible to go out of the country without having a job before you go and so on, you know. I see, I see national boundaries as, as filters rather than barriers. Uh, and and well, a hundred pounds, you're going to multiply 30, it's 3,000 pounds. But, uh, you know, for investment purposes for whatever, um, money flowing across boundaries is, is sensible. But vast sums of money which have been gambled on international foreign exchange markets um, at our expense, I think that, that's not right. So, but e even Mervyn King, who was until recently the governor of the Bank of England, even he said at a Treasury Select Committee meeting around about 2008, he said, if things don't get any better, we'll have to reintroduce exchange controls. Now that doesn't mean an absolute block on money going in and out of the country, it means some constraint. One suggestion is what they call the, um, is the transaction tax or the Robin Hood tax, where for every transaction you have a 0.01% a cost on that transaction. Now for taking your money out of the country, investing a million pounds in, in, in a, a new you know, train for the railways or whatever, that wouldn't cause a problem, but 0.01% is nothing. But if you are, uh, money is flooding backwards and forwards across exchanges every, every minute, um, you know, and it happens many times a day, it starts to build up. But it would, it would act as a break on that kind of gambling, those kind of gambling flows. and would also bring in some income which could be used for, for good social services. So the Robin Hood tax, but the city and the gamblers, the, the, the bank, are totally opposed to it. Jeremy would do it, I'm sure. But it wouldn't still stop money flowing across boundaries and money for investment, um, holiday money. I mean, you know, if, if you upgrade that for today, you know, £3,000 per person, £6,000 for a holiday, that's enough, isn't it? I would have thought. But, um, you know, we could talk about numbers, but it wouldn't be a complete block on money flowing. Um, but it would be um, co constrained so that it would be for genuine investment and for personal use. Talking about raising wages, and obviously yeah, I think yeah. you had in mind probably the lower paid members of society mm. when you said that. Can anything be done about the massive pay differentials now in a very unequal society we live in? Well, um, while we've got uh, very weak trade unions, while we've got 
companies have become very small. The, you know, trade unions were strong in big companies, uh, and, and other companies had to pay the same amount because big companies like Vauxhall were paying good wages. Um, they were unionized, and in those days, of course, because there was a labor shortage, big companies had to pay good wages to hold on to their workers. One of the reasons they introduced um, occupational pension schemes was to make sure that there was a, something that would hold the workers in their company for life so they could train them and they wouldn't just go off to some other company. If they, they, that, that, so that was a way of holding them. And of course, people in Luton, older generation now, who worked at Vauxhalls in the good days, they bought their home, they had a good wage, holidays abroad, and of course they had a good pension at the end of it. But that's all been sliding away now. Um, and yet we're a richer country in, in theory. So I, I, I would say, um, you know, wages have to go up. And we are, of the GAs, I think, we're the second worst productivity. Our productivity in Britain is the lowest apart from Japan. Japan's the only other country. All the other countries have higher wages and higher productivity. So I, I, I think high wages would be a very good thing. Um, and if we had stronger trade unions, a bit more... Um, full employment, uh, a bit more bargaining power. I think that would be a very good, very good thing for, ev for, for everyone, but also for the economy. Uh, uh, um, and uh, the way we deal with inequalities, in my view, is taxes, is through the tax system. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've put forward a, a case uh, in, in the budget debate, actually seven, eight, seven or eight years ago now, and, and there was a budget debate. It was a Thursday afternoon, it was raining outside that 12 people in the chamber and I suggested that once we've collected first of all the, the tax avoided and tax evaded which is 120 billion pounds a year a massive amount that's because of the free flow of money across boundaries we could stop that I guess gets at least a third of that back the 40 billion pounds a year on the health service to solve all the problems but anyway I suggested that once you've done all that what about raising tax rates on the rich but not by five percent you know getting proper increases in tax rates. So if we had, for those on £70,000 a year, and first of all, I apologise to everybody in the room who earns more than £70,000 a year, because I'm going to be upset you by saying that taxes, the top part of your income above 70000 should be at um, a 50% rate rather than 45. And then on 100000 should we say a 60% rate? And 200000 a 70% rate? These in tax rates would bring in quite a lot of money. Um, but they're nothing like the tax rates we had when Dennis Healy was Chancellor back in the 1970s and he said he was going to squeeze the rich until the pits squeak. There's nothing like the super tax rates we had after the Second World War when George Bernard Shaw, um, who was a socialist of course, and he, he said, he, said I, he was paying tax at 98% because he was very wealthy. The top part of his income at 98%. He said, I regard myself as a tax collector for the government for which I get a 2% premium. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but, you know, and I know rich people, I say this myself, I say this is genuine, I, I, my income is now £74,000 a year plus my wife's pension and my pensions from our previous jobs. Um, our house mortgage is paid off um, I, and I don't know what to do with my money. I, I've got enough to do all the things I want to do. Um, I can help my children with their, their, their lives as well. I should be paying more tax. One of the reasons I said 70000 a year is because we get a bit more than 70000 so I'd be part of it. I'm not talking about other people, I'm talking about me as well. Um, and uh, we, I think we should raise taxes on the better off again. Maybe not going back to Dennis Seeley's time or, or the, or the post-war world of super tax, but nevertheless we should raise taxes and start. To, but we've got to, I think, have, um, before we do all that, to start collecting the tax that's avoided and evaded. There's a man called Richard Murphy who's written a book called The Joy of Tax which I think is, you know, he wrote about a year or two back and he's a friend of mine. And I, I, I think it's, it's a wonder when I'm paying my taxes, I think I'm paying for the health service. And I want the health service to be better. It's underfunded, desperately underfunded. We spend 2% less of our GDP on health than Germany, France, wherever. Um, and that's the equivalent of between 40 and 50 billion pounds a year. So if we just had a, paid a bit more tax or collected a bit more tax and paid 40 billion pounds a year extra for the health service, we wouldn't have all the problems we've got at the moment. Uh, we, we could just sol solve the problem. And it's not the, the system of National Health Service, which is brilliant and extremely efficient, actually. The fact that they can get away with it 
get away with running a health service on the little money they do is because they're working miracles on a bloody pittance. You said don't get enough money. The, the system doesn't get enough money. So I, 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 I say all these things and I say them on the doorstep and people don't. And I, what I do is I say to you and, and I like to say to people, if you think I'm wrong, tell me where I'm wrong and demonstrate your case. Um, and people don't say, you're not wrong, you're just mad. Well, I just, well how, why am I mad? What am I mad about? What's, what's mad about saying something sensible? Going back to a world, not going, remembering the good bits of the world that worked that we used to have. You know, post-war, the post-war social democratic settlement, it was called. Social democracy, democratic socialism, if you like. I, th I can see nothing wrong with what I'm saying at all, apart from the fact that the politicians won't even think about it at the moment, and the, you know, the media will, 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 will resist us. Sorry. In a world of um, Kelvin, where so many jobs, are, well, manufacturing jobs are now placed in China you know, and uh, countries around in that region, mm. what, what, what is the realistic future for places like Luton and you know, the old mm. manufacturing towns of, of, the, of Europe and, and, and uh, Rust Belt and America? Yeah. Well, if we just go for free trade without any constraints, is well, this is, we, we, we can't exist. Actually, our, our trading, trading problems are not with China. Um, our serious trade problems, our major trade problems, are with the rest of the EU. That's where the big balance of trade is. Um, we've got massive, much more trade with them than we do with other countries. But I, th I think that uh, if, you th if you just say, well, we'll never be able to compete with poor countries, so we might as well let all our manufacturing go to those poor countries, then we become a non-viable economy. Um, and so that can't happen. So, but also, we, there's, we're now talking about a world where we reintroduce a degree of, of, um, of constraint on trade. Um, protectionism, they call it. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that um, they don't include exchange rates in protectionism. But if you actually dramatically reduce your exchange rates, so imports become expensive and exports become cheap, that's protectionism, as well. and that, that's, I think protectionism will come back because otherwise countries like Britain will become non-viable in time. Uh, and we, we, we have to have um, you know, a, a reasonable balance in our economy. And in those other countries which are poorer than us, where they've been forced to open their borders to products from rich countries, um, I would say to them, if I was in a, a poorer country, I'd say, no, we're not going to accept, we're going to have cons constraints on imports from those countries, we're going to build our own economy. We're still dumping cheap sugar in Malawi from the European Union. Um, when the Malawians can perfectly well produce their own sugar if they get a chance, but when, you know, they've, they've got under, undercut constantly by surpluses being dumped on them. So I, I would say let's, free trade is, is a kind of shibboleth, it's a kind of um, belief that everybody thinks is good. Well, I've, there's a book I've got at home, which I've read, this is written by an Australian economist, demonstrating that actually since free trade came about, the world economy has got worse and output across the world has actually, uh, gro sorry, growth, not output, growth has actually slowed, and, but in severe stages. Um, For, forgive me for interrupting, but I, I, I noticed that we're on half past. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I'm so, my, my answers are far so, too long. Uh, right. <laughs> they're very full. <laughs> the, could we make this the last question? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just, just a comment. Do you think all free traders in the world should be gathered together and exiled to Tasmania, where they can have as much free trade as they want? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Um, there was one other point I was going to make about, about, about trade, um, but I can't remember what I was going to say now. But nevertheless, it's. Uh, it, I, I, um, oh, yeah, one point about this thing about China. China reduced the value of their currency to a third of its previous value. They used a massive depreciation to give a kickstart to their economy, which worked. Um, so, you know, the Chinese did this massive depreciation, which stopped us exporting to them. But, uh, and um, I don't blame China for doing that. I mean, they want to build their economy and they've got a chance to do it. So, let, you know, it's, it's uh, that kind of world. But I, I think what China's got to do, and they're probably, because they're intelligent, intelligent people, are now probably starting to grow demand within their own economy for the things they produce, because that's what they've got to do in time. Now they've developed and got skills and they've got manufacturing and, and education and so on. I think they can, they, they're now at a point where they can see their own economy starting to, to grow. But manufacturing, one a point is going to make, factories are going to become automated. Um, and, uh, you know, now they're heavily automated. 
Um, and it, there was going to come a problem for capitalism where private companies with no workers, because everything's automated, can sell these things and make profits, but there's no workers in receiving the wages. Uh, and they eventually, they get, you've got nobody buying your products because they're not earning wages. You've got to have a means of, of, shift, uh, of translating that profit from those companies into people's pockets so they can buy the things that the companies make. Now that will require a degree of intervention in economies which we haven't really contemplated yet. But I think that is going to come and pretty quickly. I mean, it, things, we're talking about artificial intelligence now and, and very uh, rapid and increasing speed of automation. So I, I really do think that uh, we're going to have to look again at how we uh, distribute income uh, in economies because you know, wages from manufacturing will not be there. So that we, uh, I could talk at greater length, but we certainly. Gavin, thank you very much for coming and for such entertaining and um, involving um, issues that you've raised. Thanks very much, everybody, for, for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the film and the discussion afterwards.